Welcome back to the channel folks and to the last in our recent series of painting guides for the Romans. As you can see this guide isn't featuring a bit of front line technology here, it's just a bit more of a statement piece, a piece of real character, something that you can put up when your army is on display or perhaps even just have lurking around at the back of the table, you know bringing a couple of on table spectators to the scene. This is the Roman Travelling Coach from Warlord Games. It's a kit which is resin in the main. You know, the coach itself is resin, the, the horses, the driver and the passengers are metal. So it's a very interesting kit in terms of how you're going to approach all these different components. I'm going to focus on the coach itself. I've got tutorials out there to paint figures, you no know, Roman figures, got tutorials for the horses and such like, so I'm going to concentrate on the coach itself. Before we get started, don't forget to check out the 28mm historical figures playlist on the channel if you want to see any of the other Roman tutorials that we've put up recently. There's quite a lot there and if this is of interest to you, then check it out and subscribe folks because we'll get more of these kind of things coming up in the future. I've applied my main undercoats already folks. I've got an overall undercoat of old wood for the, the wooden surfaces. It's going to be in the main unpainted wood so I'm just going to be shading and weathering it. Elsewhere for the metal parts I've started with an undercoat of German grey. I'm applying a thin wash all over the wooden areas. I am using flat earth for this. Now, a lot of the time if you're familiar with my washing on World War II vehicles, it'll be a pin wash. It's not a wash over the entire surface. That's not what I want to do here. I want to build up a sort of weathered wooden pattern here. So I'm going to start by getting the thin wash on, moving it around a lot so that we're going to get different levels of opacity on that wash across the wider surface of the sides and all the panels on the wagon. Then in a more controlled way I'm just cutting in a bit with the wash. Now whilst it's still wet, well, I don't know why he's making an appearance for there folks, <laughs> cutting in the, uh, the wash just to help define the shape of the individual panels. Once that's done, I'm going to let that panel dry and move on to another one. Once all the panels are dry, I'm going to go back in and start to work the panels with a little bit more wash, but you can see I'm applying it in quite a controlled way here. I want to darken down the lower area, create a bit of variety. You know, the lower area is likely to have more dirt built up over the years and then I will also want to possibly just put little spots of darker wood, create little spots of darker wood with the wash, you know, just by emphasising an individual panel or by randomly creating just a few very faint spots of a uh, darker area, almost like um, the natural variegation you'll see in the wood for knotting and such likes. For the lower areas of the wagon and the harder working areas of the wagon, I'm going to put on a quite a thick wash. I can lighten that up later on, but at the moment I just want it looking covered in muck and dirt and earth and, and hard wear, years of hard wear. So you don't have to be too careful about this, other than just making sure it doesn't look too dark. Now we're ready to start brightening up the panels and what I'm doing here folks is kind of like what I call a wet and dry brush if that makes sense. It's not a dry brushing process but neither is it an ordinary brushing process. The brush has got just enough paint on it so that it's going to come off but come off in a dry way 
that allows a lot of paint to come off, not in a dry way where a tiny little amount of paint will come off. And what happens when you follow this approach is you get an uneven coverage so that you're starting to build up layers of lighter paint but it's building up in an irregular way. It takes a little bit of experience to know when your brush is right and to know when you've got to change out the brush, you know, get it cleaned up and then dried a little bit. I normally draw off the moisture in my hand and I get the paint on there and little bits of paint, not too much, but it's got to be quite thick paint, make sure it's not thinned down, you know, you're just working straight out of the bottle, so to speak. And then you're just going to very lightly brush it over the surface and the brush will dry. The more you use it each time, the drier it will get, it'll end up getting just like a dry brush and you don't want that. You want it to be coming off irregular, but smooth. You don't want it to get lumps down folks. So it's a little bit tricky, but once you've mastered it, it's very, very easy to do it. Now, hopefully you can see the, the build up of a patina on the wood here. You know, you can see different medium colors of the wood, you know, the finished color, different shade colors, you know, and then there's a mixture of that going on all over the panels. Don't all look the same. It's not just a solid wall of wood. It's a wall made up of individual panels. And to help accentuate that, we're now going to go in with a highlight. And I'm using Iraqi sand for this, folks. Now, this is one with one process that's definitely going to require a lot of patience. You're not going to get a better result here, folks, by thinking you need to rush on. Use a brush with a good thin point. Make sure your paint is thin sufficiently so that it flows off the brush with a slight contact on the figure. Because remember, the edge here is very, very fine. It's a resin piece. It's not um, a chunky metal edge. But make sure that the paint is not going to flow off the edge. It's going to stay on in just one pass. And make sure you're refreshing your brush regularly. A small brush with a little bit of paint will dry much more quickly than a larger brush with more paint on it, you know, that's got more moisture in there. That's the exposed wooden panels done now, folks, so we can turn our attention to the colour trim. Now I'm going to be painting this red, so I'm starting with a layer of burnt cadmium red. Now, normally when you're putting a base colour of layer down, you're going to want to put down two coats for a nice solid layer of paint. In this case, however, I want to once again build up a worn patina. So I'm going to be putting down just one coat. I may rework certain areas a little bit just for extra variety, but one coat so that some of the, the colour of the wood underneath is going to show through. Painting the trim and the edges is going to help give the finished figure a, a great deal of definition. If it was all just the uh, un unpainted wood, you know, the plain wooden panels and then plain wooden edges, it's not going to have such a clear shape. It's not going to be such an interesting figure. So consider carefully the colour you want to use for your trim. That will determine a great deal the final appearance of the kit. That's the base layer of red down and hopefully you can see that it's not a solid layer. You know, it's got a bit of variegation, so to speak, if that's the right word, in the surface there. Now we're ready to add the main coat of paint and this is just red. That's what it says on the bottle, folks, red. So we're going to apply this once again with just one coat, one thin coat. We're not going to go for a, a smooth, complete, opaque surface here folks and we're going to try and be guided by what's been left in the undercoat in the burnt cadmium red so that we're going to get a brighter finish but one that still keeps the variety that's in that base coat as much as is practical and attractive. So we're putting this coat of red on quite thin and then reworking it 
as required. If we think it needs to be a bit more solid just to create that bit of variety, an area of less heavy wear and weathering, then just use a little bit of paint that's a bit thicker for that area and then build it up. But don't go too far. Um, you will find that you end up just overpainting everything. It's kind of like cooking folks, you know, you can add too much salt and then you're done because you can't take it out. But if it's not got enough salt, you can always add it more in. And it's kind of like that for these variegated weathered kind of looks. Now that we've created some semi-opaque layers, we're going to go in with a bit more of an opaque layer of red just to help add a bit more depth to it. It's almost like this is like the paint that has not yet weathered and all other areas around it are starting to chip away, fade away and it gives a nice varied look again. And we can also be hitting the edges here folks too. To a degree it helps give some shape to the, to the individual um, strips but don't overdo it because remember we're creating a weathered look. We've got another stage to do but it's a bit of a, a difficult balance in that you need to brighten the edge but not kill the weathering. Now to finish off the weathering we're going to take a, a bit of a, a beat up brush but it's still got a decent edge and some of the original colour, that's old wood. And we're going to start sort of bouncing that brush along the edges to show where the paint has been removed completely. The red paint that is, exposing the brighter wood underneath that has been protected from the weather so it's brighter than the surrounding panels. You can also place a few small effectively scratches and chips within the core red areas of these trims too and that just adds to the weathered look but don't go over the top, don't get too carried away with this, it's an accent, it's not a dominant look unless you want the wagon to look as though it's on its last legs. Okay folks, we're now ready to move on to the metallic areas. Now I gave all these a first coat of German grey, that's going to be our shade colour. Now we're going to be leaving some of that German grey in recesses and such lights and that's us already got the dark areas literally covered. Now we're going to add a layer of dark grey. Dark grey is a lot lighter than German grey. It's a good sort of mid-tone for a non-metallic metal approach, a very basic non-metallic metal approach. At this point I wished I hadn't glued the wheels on, but you know when I got it out of the box I got all excited and wanted to put it all together to see how it looked. Bit of a schoolboy error folks, so keep the wheels off, glue them on when you're done. It'll make your life a lot easier. If you can do these little, almost like sub-assemblies, that's your sort of official word, break your kit down into different pieces, it's going to make it a lot easier to get into all those different areas, especially if they are hidden behind big large wheels. The highlight for the metal is going to be London grey. It's a lighter grey that is not too light so it's not too much of a step up from the dark grey. But that will help us create a little bit of a metallic glint so to speak but a dull metallic glint. You can go brighter with for instance deck tan if you're looking for a more pronounced highlight but I'm using London grey in this case here. And I'm applying it to the edges for edge highlights but also as a, a spot highlight, you could call it that, on things such as bolts and um, uh, fastenings and such like. Now I'm going to wash the wheels with a dark earth pigment. You don't have to take this approach, you can just use the same wash colour for instance we've been using elsewhere, but the dark earth pigment gives it a bit more of a gritty and earthy finish. It's not going to stand out incredibly strong because we're not layering it on thick. As you can see there's no dramatic sort of visual effect being created here, we're just creating a nice weathered layer for 
a slightly different appearance to the rest of the washing on the, the panels, you know, the areas that are not going to be getting all the dirt. That's the exterior of the wagon completed, so let's go on to the interior. And I'm, I've decided to use white for this, folks, just to keep it nice and bright. So I've started with an overall coat of London Grey. Then I've picked out each panel with deck tan, leaving the London Grey in the gaps between the panels. And then I'm going to layer it up a bit with some off-white. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, folks, because it's going to be very hard to see any of this. Even though we're going to be able to take the roof off, there's still not that much to see here, so don't go crazy. It's hard to work with because it's an internal area. Just keep it nice and simple and bright. The seats I've decided to paint with a green fabric. You could do red as well, but you know, I'm sick of painting red at the end of this Roman project, so it's going to be green. And I should point out that you're not going to see very much off the seat when the figures, when the passengers are glued in place. So don't worry too much about your choice here, folks. Now we can go to the roof. I think the roof is made of fabric. I could be wrong, but the approach I'm going to take here will look right whether it is made of fabric or whether it is just a white painted roof. The fact that it isn't panelled makes me think, even if it's a solid roof, there is a fabric stretched over it. So. I'm going to try and build up the appearance of fabric that's been drawn tight over a curved surface. Just like the interior, I've started with a coat of deck tan. I've not used anything as dark as London Grey because we don't want there to be too much contrast here. So a solid coat of deck tan and then I'm starting to build up lines using off-white. You can see it's a, a quick, careless process, but you want to try and preserve some defining lines of that deck tan when you're doing this. We're not looking for a solid opaque coat of off-white. And I'm going to use the same colours for the, the rolled up tarpaulin cover for the door. You're going to have to apply this paint in a couple of layers, folks, to get the right sort of semi-opaque finish. White paint isn't going to go on in one go, in one layer. It's a tricky paint to work with, but we want a stripy finish for this anyway. You know, like to create that taut fabric kind of appearance. So, come back to it, rework it, remembering to leave those darker areas. Then to finish off, we're going to use some nice white, pure white, not off-white, but the whitest white you've got in your collection and we'll put on a few really nice bright lines especially along the, the bottom edges and uh, the front and the back as well as going over the top and that will just give it that extra layer of contrast that you need to create some nice shape on the top there. And that's us done folks, that's the completed wagon. Hopefully it's been interesting, giving you a few ideas. Do you want to add this level of bling to your Roman collection. I think it's a great project and would look good on any war game table or any display cabinet as well. So thank you for watching folks. Thank you to all the subscribers out there as well as you guys that just like to drop in from time to time to see what's happening on the channel. Check out the 28mm historical playlist for the various other Roman tutorials that we have. I think there's about four different tutorials in addition to this one, as well as many, many other ones. If you'd like to subscribe, folks, hit that button. Help us build the channel. Help me know what, um, what kind of subjects you guys are interested in as well. And it helps YouTube bring this kind of content to people who enjoy it. So, thanks again, folks. Hit the subscribe button, hit the bell button, and that means we'll definitely see you all on the next one.